Hi. Welcome. Welcome to Playback. This is our last event. Um, thank you so much for those of you who's, who's been with me since the beginning, since <laughs> there's one person there. Um, so we've, been, we've had events over the last uh, four days um, and of course our wonderful exhibition in the, in the theatre space. So if you haven't seen it already, it's 145 short films by young filmmakers from across England. Um, and for many it was their, their first um, experience making a film and they're all just so fantastic and so diverse. So please go and have a look and watch watch the films today. This is their, your last chance to see it here at the ICA. Um, so it's finishing tonight at 6 p.m. And then we're actually going to take the exhibition on tour for the next year. Um, so we're going all around England, different uh, galleries and libraries and multi-arts venues. Um, and we'll be back at the ICA in March next year with a whole load of new films and festival events. Uh, so I hope you can come back then. Um, so the last event, we thought we should do something on what are the next steps for Random Acts filmmakers. Um, and so we've got a lovely panel of them here today. We're going to watch some of their films and we're going to talk to them about how they make their process of making the film and what they've done since. Um, and we've got Anne to chair. Would you like to say something first or would you like to just go straight into the films? <laughs> I'll pass over to you. All right, thank you. Hi, thank you very much for coming. As Corinne said, uh, my name's Anne Beresford. I'm an independent producer working in film and television, and I've produced or executive produced about 10 random acts. I've done all kinds of work, whether that's documentary or feature films on much bigger budgets, um, but always very excited to make interesting work with interesting people, and thank you for coming today. Um, just to introduce who, who's with us, um, first of all, we're going to talk to Jessica Wright and Morgan Ranika Tumple with their film, The Triat. And then we're going to talk to Fritzi Nicholas, producer, and Joe Campbell, one of the directors from Sulphur Spring. And then we're going to finish with Charlie Lyon and his amazing film, Blackout. Um, so, Jess and Morgan, why don't you come up, first of all, and... Um, well, we can share. Um, just to say, um, I produced the tryout, so I'm going to put my cards on the table, uh, um, working with Jess and Morgan, and we'd worked together a couple of times before. But the tryout was, it was your first film for television, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And it was produced in 2014 for part of the Random Acts Big Dance Scheme that was about collaborations between the UK and Brazil. So... Uh, all of the films had to have an element of film, obviously, and dance, and something to do with the UK and something to do with Brazil. And that could have been a filmmaker or a choreographer or a theme or a composer, whatever. Um, and so th this was made for that scheme. Uh, the whole theme of Brazil was interpreted very widely by the rest of the scheme. So one of the films had a couple of uh, dancers from English National Ballet, so classical ballet dancers who come over from Brazil who talked about the ideas of, of uh, home and what it meant to be belong. To belong. Jess and Morgan's film was very different. I've got you up now, now we're going to show the film. So let's hop down, show the tryout and then come back and have a chat. Um, obviously that was produced for the Random Acts scheme. Neither of you has a traditional filmmaking background. I don't know what a traditional filmmaking background is, but I think it's fair to say that you two don't have it. Can you say a bit about what you do as your day job? And have you got a mic? Yeah. yeah. Does this work? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we met at ballet school um, about 17 years ago now. Um, and yeah, we met when we were training and became best friends um, and didn't have any kind of ambitions to make films or anything like that. Um, so yeah, I work for, um, when we're not making films, I work for Company Wayne McGregor, which is um, a dance, a contemporary dance company, um, and tour a lot performing. And um, yeah, we were just, we just had a run at Sadler's Wells Theatre now, doing a piece called Tree of Codes, which is just finished, um, yeah, last night finished, so yeah. And uh, I started out as a dancer also, and then uh, now I work as a choreographer. I'm a freelance choreographer and movement director. And so how did you get into filmmaking? Did you just pick up a phone one day and start <laughs> filming? 
Yeah, um, we were we were waiting for a night bus. This is pre Uber. Not that I don't think we could have afforded an Uber at the time. Anyway, and um, 2005, I think. Yeah, and had like a you know one of the first mobile phones that could do films when when kind of film recording first came out on mobile phones. And we made a little short film. You know that thing that people do with the like Eiffel Tower, holding it with a hand like perspective thing anyway, we kind of did that and thought it was really, <laughs> it was really great but obviously lots of people were doing it and then we kind of made it into a little film and then uh, we had a lot of time on our hands yeah and, um, just yeah it was kind of fun I guess so we just made a short um, one minute film and then from there we thought okay well maybe we'll just uh, invest a bit more in our when we're off contract when we're not dancing and so we made a few more and then eventually we made one we applied for an arts council grant um, and we worked with MJW Productions with Anne and Mags um, made a longer film then uh, and then yeah and then did a random act so the progress for you was literally being bored at a bus stop shooting something on a mobile phone and then gradually over four or five years getting to the stage where you persuaded first of all the Arts Council England to give you some money to do a short film and then that meant you had something you had a calling card if you like is that how you saw it to apply to random acts um, yeah I guess I guess it's kind of funny to think back on how it all fit together I guess but um yeah, we did that. We we decided that we we'd made several short things. So we did the kind of night bus thing with the big hand pushing small person around. And I had, um, a friend of ours who was actually a filmmaker had said, "Oh, why don't you enter that into?" There was something called Cobra Vision Shorts at the time, which was he had to do a series of I think was it ten or ten second clips that all kind of had some coherence to them. So we ended up sending it in, and then it was actually shown kind of it was shown and it was picked and for the final and we were like oh great carried on doing a few bits and bobs and then you know we'd made several things I guess Morgan always tended to do the camera and I always tended to be the one jumping around in front of the camera so it was just really the two of us and several people saw them and said oh you know they're really great but you know I, I, at some point the penny dropped that if we really wanted to do it we would need to you know increase our production values <laughs> and work with the crew um so that's why we applied to the arts council and got that and then came and approached you guys and obviously we had a few things to show you and luckily you had faith in what we were doing and said yeah we'd be interested in doing that so we managed to make that and then after that yeah i guess we um heard about the random acts thing and thought that would be a and great opportunity the random acts uh, it, it doesn't say that you you know, you doesn't. We don't have. You didn't have to be professional filmmakers to enter for it. It was kind of encouraging people from dance backgrounds to get involved in the film as well. Yeah. So we. Yeah. And I said this was part of a scheme that had to have a bit of the UK and a bit of Brazil in. Can you just be explicit for us about what what are the Brazilian elements in that story that we've just seen? The composer. We worked with a Brazilian composer, and um, I guess we took the idea of this um, choro band, which is a kind of traditional Brazilian type of music. And um, yeah, we hadn't, you know, we hadn't had some great idea of working, uh, we hadn't written some treatment about a Brazilian choro band, but we heard about this and we were like, okay, I guess we'd been working, we'd been developing and working more with our ideas in terms of how the camera moves and choreography for the camera and what you can do in post-production. And we were especially obsessed with reverse at this time, um, you may have noticed. Um, so we had like lots of ideas that were kind of specifically like filmic choreographic language ideas rather than, and then we kind of wrote the treatment to be able to kind of embody those ideas. So in, in this instance, the scheme actually provoked the idea, the scheme, you know, was, yeah. was a question that you then went on to answer with that with that film. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't, um, yeah, we came up with the story because of, the application but I have but having said that I think we had been developing like a lot of those ideas in there in terms of um, movement ideas choreography of the camera choreography of the dancer and, and things that we really wanted to kind of develop on that on that level and then it was just finding a story to kind of hang it on in a way and what was it different for you you said how you know it was just the two of you and you were hopping around in front of the camera and you were holding the camera or the phone and then gradually you were getting slightly bigger and bigger and bigger and when you were making something that was going to be your first broadcast commission you know what was different about that for you or did that change the way you work at all 
Um, the tryout was shot, it was the first time we worked, uh, well, actually mishandled, we worked with Mags who shot it, but um, uh, we worked with the cinematographer, John, and because uh, previous to that I had been shooting and I've got no um, sort of photography training, so it was, uh, I was sort of moving the camera around and breaking lots of rules. So it, w we went through quite a big process of sort of having to discuss how we could um, get this movement of the camera in a way that's that's why some of it's still pretty jerky I think it's because we we really wanted to have this moving camera but uh, we had lots of conversations with John about a really big camera and how you know they can't it can't move that quickly and so that was quite a big learning curve for us but then um, so I guess we sort of had to adapt our our filmic ideas in that way but then other things obviously really kind of uh, became much richer working with a, a professional crew yeah so was there more of a pressure of time having to do something for a broadcaster you know when you're when it's just the two of you can you just do what you like whenever you want to do it well i think we're always kind of working within the confines of our schedules and the limited little pockets of where we both have a few days it's i don't think we've ever made a film even the first one that we made when we were unemployed and lounging around at bus stops and kind of decided to make a film because we had nothing else to do i don't think we've ever been in a situation where it's just felt unpressured for time it always because everything always grows and expands as i'm sure everyone in the room knows that just kind of keeps going and you keep wanting to do more and the goalposts shift and you never feel like there's you know there's never enough time but um yeah it was very different experience doing working with a proper so I think we had a, did we have a crew of about 20 for that yeah, yeah. and um it was it, yeah as Morgan said previously we'd been doing everything just the two of us um so it was actually incredibly challenging to work with the crew for the first time and obviously not coming from a film world you know we're like we don't know what producer means we kind of just about knew what cinematographer meant but there were all these people there who were kind of like we're just here to you know help make your vision and we were like okay but you know we kind of suddenly they were kind of like, oh you can't film from there that's crossing the line we were like what line you know we don't know what crossing the line means and we were like but we like it that way and they're like okay but you know that's not technically the correct way to do it but if it's a choice and we're like well it's our choice and you know there was kind of these constant um you know, I was saying to our DP, but can't you just shoot it from there and like from this angle and him kind of going, um, what are we, what, what, can you show us the action? We were like, we can't show the action. It's in reverse. It's impossible. Like you just, so it was, um, I think it was very, probably very challenging for our collaborators, especially our DP on our first film because um, we were total control freaks basically and had done everything ourselves. And um, it was very difficult for us to kind of let go on the reins a bit. But um, I think what's been amazing about our transition since that film and doing more films with crew and understanding how that works and understanding a little bit more, still not all of it, about the film world, um, what's really been very liberating actually is to really feel the actual benefit and joy of collaboration where you can say to your collaborators okay this is what we're thinking how would you you know where would you shoot that from okay that's you know you've brought and seeing how that can really enrich the work but um yeah at this at this point it was pretty challenging so the film's been shown at festivals you've been nominated for awards it's done really really well we know that you're both still working as choreographers and and dancers how have you managed to keep the film and dance world together um and have they been of mutual benefit to each other what have you gone on to do after random acts um so the film that we made after this um we were asked by english national ballet to uh, we were commissioned by emb and tate liverpool to make a film um using for their engagement department department using young dancers from the liverpool region um and that probably came about through your relationship with them yeah so i had created i'd choreographed a piece for english national ballet and then they said do you want to uh make a dance film and uh i i think they'd seen the work that me, me and jess make together and so yeah they they asked us to, but it was the first time that um the edu the education participation department of english national ballet had commissioned a film so um I think we sort of really, really pushed to have it uh, made by a professional crew and um, 
to, to make the work that we're really interested in doing, which is sort of quite time consuming. Um, but that's been that's been a really good relationship, and we've made two films with EMB. So we made uh, a film called The Last Resort that hasn't actually been released yet, for which was shown in the Tate Liverpool, um, and it was related to an exhibition that was on the Tate Liverpool. Um, kind of responding to this photographs of Martin Parr. And then we made a film following that, I think which you're going to see a little bit of, called Curing Old Brecht, which was uh, in response to the ballet of Giselle, which, because EMB were doing, uh, they didn't, I don't know if anyone's seen, but they did a new version of Giselle recently. Um, and so they commission um, education work and other um, media, I suppose, to support their main programme. So that was co-commissioned by MIF. And um, that was shown before the performance of Chazelle in, in Manchester and then at Sadler's Wells. Um, and it's going to be shown on Canal TV uh, and some festivals as well. So that's a pretty big progress. I mean, I was, I was there. I happened to be there in Manchester. You know, you made a film that was shown before the very, very first performance ever of the new Akram Khan Giselle. And it seems to me that it's getting bigger and bigger. So it's a great, it's a, it's a really nice, it's kind of, it was kind of quite an amazing moment for us actually because, you know, it was a big opera house. So it was full of, I guess, about what 1,500 people. And um, it's not, you know, you've kind of got your audience captive. It's not like they can switch on and switch off. They're all sitting down and they think they've come to see this ballet, but then they were kind of forced to sit through our five-minute film. Um, so we were like, yeah. Um, I think we should have a look at Curing Albrecht now. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, you can now. A really interesting example of how Jess and Morgan have extended the humour and the wit and the creative use of backwardsness and other techniques um, all the way through from, as they said, standing at the bus stop with their mobile phone to making a film with lots and lots of dancers that's been shown on enormous stages and will continue to be seen for a long time. We're going to keep uh, with dance for a moment and come forward to 2016. And um, Fritzi, Nicholas and Joe will join us in a minute after we've had a look at Sulphur, uh, Sulphur Spring. Now, that was one of five films produced for this year's version of Random Act's Big Dance Shorts. When Jess and, and Morgan made theirs, the theme was the collaboration between UK and Brazil. This year, the theme was Dance Decades, which was also celebrating the fact that Big Dance was 10 years old. So again, people took the theme and used it in really different ways. There was one film which was like four generations of a family sitting on a sofa watching a Hollywood noir movie. Um, there was another film that was about older people kind of sitting in their kitchens, knitting in their living rooms, also apparently being astronauts at the same time. Um, and this film, which was directed by Oscar Aldershaw, who would love to be here, but is filming in Dubai at the moment, and by Joe Campbell. And it also features performance by Oscar's dad. So let's have a look at Sulphur Spring and then have a chat with Fritzi and Joe. Um, so very different. A very different understanding of dance as well. Yes. But Fritzi, you were the producer on this. Were Correct. you there right from the beginning? You know, what did Oscar come to you with? Or what did Joe come to you with? Yeah, it was... Um, Os Oscar called me up in um, January last year, 2016. Um, and Oscar and I had worked before... Um, once once um, once before uh, on a music video and he was a camera assistant and then he called me up in January um, and I remember him being really nervous he's saying I've, I've, I've got this treatment I'd like to send you and um, would love to know if, if you're if you're interested in um, in coming on board and uh, I just remember him saying please don't think I'm crazy just have a look um, <laughs> and uh, and let me know what you think and then he sent it to me um, and I read it and absolutely fell in love with it um it's 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 a challenging it was a really challenging project because he decided to go to iceland um shoot with um older dancers and um uh he i think that's why he was really afraid um that i would just tell him no you, you you're crazy on a small budget um but we made it happen and um i think yeah that's um that's how it all started um we, we then developed the script together um he went on a on a journey to um to iceland in february i think last year it was um and changed the script a little bit um after he um 
he went to see the place and uh, Recky did in a, in a way. I mean, my memory, um, because when we do the big dance random acts, it's an open call. I think we had something like 300 applications last year. We read all 300, then we get it down, then we get it down again to about 20 mm. and we interview those people. My memory is that when Oscar sent, when that, that first treatment came in, it was lots of bright colours and it was all the sort of my idea of, you know, a hot spring and like yeah. in a hotel. It, it, was, it was really sort of almost 1950s holiday camp. But yeah. it, now we've got this blues and browns and a much mm -hmm. dourer, darker film. Can you just say a bit about how that, that changed? Yeah. Um, well, the the initial idea was uh, filming a group of um, older dancers in hot springs, moving probably in a kind of comical way, um, but very choreographed, um, and then disappearing into the steam of hot springs. But uh, I think it changed completely after Oscar had been to to Iceland for two weeks, and um, you, both of you worked on on the idea, developed it, and, and changed it. And I think maybe. Maybe his experience, I guess, or your experience um, of, of being there uh, changed completely. Also, Oscar then, um, or you and Oscar, uh, decided to involve Oscar's family heavily. I mean, the the, the, the old man who gets um, nearly naked at, at the end is Oscar's dad. His mom is in there, his sister is in there. It was all family, really. Um, I guess Oscar's family is really um, really involved in film. His mom is an actress as well. His dad is a performer. So uh, what I loved about it is how he um, how he involved his whole family in it and uh, and, and changed the, the the idea completely. I think it was a bit of a surprise to all of us um, because it was initially a very different uh, idea that was pitched in and and what got him the commission and then it it just developed uh, into something completely different. I mean, Joe, it would be great to find out about your experiences, about, you know, we've heard Jess and Morgan talk about how they work together. Maybe you could talk about how you and Oscar work together and what must have been really challenging yeah. circumstances. Yeah, so, well, me and Oscar have been working together for about 10 years, actually, because um, we studied fine art together and um, our kind of heroes have often been kind of like DIY filmmakers, like quite like underground stuff, like George and Mike Kushar, this kind of thing. So a lot of people, like people who don't use big crews or anything like this. And so um, it was kind of quite a new experience to to work with a DP even um, that wasn't one of us. Um, so that was quite that was quite a new thing. Um, it was incredibly windy and <laughs> cold out there and we had to like trek for quite a long way to get to the spot that we wanted to film at. And um, because Oscar's dad has actually got Parkinson's um, we weren't sure how uh, um, how much we would actually be able to move through the landscape, um, so that's why we've partly why we've got that kind of sedan chair as kind of not just a kind of filmic device, but also a practical one for getting him around. And that's kind of why um, it the, the the kind of it changed because you know it was originally going to be in a kind of like hot spring kind of set place, and then we thought well we weren't sure if we were going to actually be able to get to the hot springs where all the amazing steam and vapour and everything is. So we changed it to, to be more of a journey and a procession to, and have like more kind of episodic things happening along the way. Uh, and just to say from my side, you know, I was series producer on this, so I'm responsible for de delivering the series to the commissioners, to Big Dance and to Channel 4. Um, just to say that we kept that conversation going all the way through because you know, you don't want to arrive at, at, at a rough cut of something and go, hang on, I thought I'd just commissioned, you know, this funny film about X, Y and Z and I'm now seeing this incredibly sad film about A, B and C. But it was something that we, we carried on that discussion all the way through and you could see how the ideas were developing. But m maybe, Joe, can you say a bit about how you two work together? Is it that you look after the edit and he looks after the shoot or one of you looks after the camera and one of you looks after the cast or how does it work? Yeah, well, I think on this time, I mean, it's kind of, we switch around roles all the time, basically, because he works as a cinematographer and I've been kind of working in, with performance artists quite a lot over the last few years. So at this time, um, he kind of was looking at shots and I was working with the performers. Um, Fritzi, you said early on that it was challenging. I'm sure it was it was hugely challenging being out there in the cold 
and the wind. But I'm also sure it was incredibly challenging sitting in the office thinking, oh my goodness me, I've got a very tiny budget. Yeah. How am I going to make this work? Mm. You know, I, to speak very cynically, what's in it for you as a producer? Because I can't believe it was enormous sums of money. <laughs> no, it wasn't the money for sure. <laughs> um, it's, I think, as a, as a producer, I, 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 I get really excited about um, interesting creative project and projects and it's you know budget shouldn't be an obstacle um, you can and everyone can make a film you don't need to have uh, huge amounts of, of money and it's just being clever how you approach something um, I think we've we've been very lucky with the crew that we had on board um, with having Oscar's family involved uh, from very early on um, also, we um, actually um, we had done a project uh, in Iceland about six months before that, so we already knew a few local people. We didn't really involve that many, but we had some we had some locals we could speak to. We could um, ask where are good locations. Um, we had our sound person from up there who we who we um, met through the crew that we had um, shot with before six months before. So it's 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 just you, I think you have to work around all the challenges and just make it work for you um, and, and, and it really did um, and I think especially like when I from my point of view when when it comes to um, films like this you you know people get really excited and you can ask people for favors as well um, you get people to work on you know very little rates or for free because you then get them on other projects where you can actually pay people for so that's kind of you find the balance and you make it you make it work really and can you say a bit about you know have you shown the film has it has it have you gone into other pitches and said oh look at this work you know what what's it meant for you for both of you for Joe and for you as a company um, yeah maybe you start. yeah um, <laughs> we've we've definitely shown shown the film before and um, I think everyone we've had a really good response to it everyone really likes it. Although you kind of see like, oh, what's this? You know, it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a different one, really. And um, I think for if I I'll just speak for Oscar, maybe for um, Oscar, it's been it's been a, a real progression. He's um, he's texted me the other day saying, oh, I really want to speak to you about the next um, big dance commission. I, I have some thoughts. So it's it's kind of yeah. It's I think it's it's a good stepping stone um, for all of us in a way. Mm. Yeah, I think it hasn't led to anything like directly yet, but it's certainly like an amazing thing to have in your back pocket when you're applying for other things. It's just, yeah, it gives you so much more confidence to approach people and yeah. ask them. Great. Well, thanks. Do save up some questions because I'm hoping we're going to have time to all talk together at the end. But maybe we could do a little swap now, and Charlie could come up yes. and say a few words. Thank you very much. So hi, hi everyone. Charlie, you have many strings to your bow. You're a director and a writer and a critic as well. And um, you've just had a film at Sundance, haven't you? Uh, yeah, a short, not, not this short that we're going to watch, but a different one, yeah. So can you say a bit about where did Random Acts come in your career? What had you done before you made your Random Act? I'd made, um, like you say, I, I was working before as a film critic, and so I'd made a couple of films that were really kind of coming out of that, that were themselves film criticism. So they were essay films built from kind of existing material and using that to critique cinema in some way. Um, so I'd made a few things by the point that, um, that I started talking to Random Acts, and um, Random Acts was kind of the first thing where I wanted to do something that was essentially still in that area but but taking it beyond kind of straightforward film criticism and, and kind of using essay film and um, collage, visual collage uh, in, a, in a slightly more avant-garde way. So your film wasn't part of a season. I mean, the, the two other films were, were part of a series of five commissions. Yours was very much standing on its own. Yeah, not that I know of. Uh, it was it was on the t it was on the TV. It was in the the previous series uh, with Eric Wareheim. So I guess it was commissioned as part of that. But no, there was no like overarching theme or anything. I Although think I think of it as a dance film. Okay, well that's going to be a very interesting discussion afterwards. Let's have a look. Let's let's see the film now and then talk further afterwards.
Um, I think it's an extraordinary film, and it's fantastic to see it on on a big screen here. I, I've got to ask you about the so much to take in. So yeah. there is so much to take in. I've got to talk to you about the practicalities of it. What are we actually seeing? Are there like seventeen different edits of black in there? Yeah. So essentially, if, if it's not clear, the um the, the footage that you're seeing are scenes from the films that are listed at the bottom that are entirely dark, that depict perfectly dark scenes within the films. Um, so, yeah, you're seeing kind of nothing, but um, they are that is real footage that has been actually transferred and, uh, and presented. It's not a cheat, I promise, but there's no way of you verifying that, apart from like the odd like glitch that shows up somewhere on the screen. Um, so yeah, it was a. It, it took a surprisingly long time to realise that um, more or less plain black screen that you just watched for three minutes. I must have been incredibly complicated because did you have to get copyright clearance for all those? Well, so it's actually done using uh, fair use or fair dealing, as we call it here, um, which is an odd one to apply in this circumstance because, uh, to be honest, like you can pretty much get away with using the perfectly dark moments of a film. Like that's not going to trigger any like YouTube copyright claim uh, algorithms, but uh, but obviously we had to do it properly and legally. So yeah, the, the principle stands and. Um, in our case, it was the fair dealing exemption of uh, pastiche. So you're pastiching what it is to experience darkness in a film um, through the medium of all these different excerpts. So it's free, but you have to use a lawyer. And do you know if any of the films, or at, at any of the surviving filmmakers, who, or people involved in the films that you featured have seen the work? I'd be very surprised. Uh, no, quite well, possibly. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. You'd have to. They'd have to have like an eagle-eyed friend because it's not as though you'd recognise any of your own material in there without spotting the credit. And was this a really different thing for you to do? Was it a way of? Was this a way in which you were changing your <laughs> filmmaking style, or does it fit into a kind of developing theme of your work? I think yes, or, yes, and no. Like uh, all the work I've made, more or less, bar a couple of things, is is cannibalizing existing materials. So it was very much in my wheelhouse in that sense, but as I was saying before, like most of what I made was much more um, direct and much more kind of uh, clearly um, film criticism. Uh, so it would have a narrator who would be kind of telling you a certain thing and you'd be seeing images at the same time and making a connection between the two and that's kind of where you drew out the, the critique, but um, with this, obviously, it's much more implicit and much more kind of avant-garde in nature, um, which for me was like, I mean, this sort of was accidental at the time, but in hindsight, like, I'm now trying to make a film that, again, is, is um, essayistic, but is much more in a kind of artist-moving image realm. And it's very hard to get into that world, as I'm sure anyone in here who is trying or already in that world knows. If anyone's already in that world, please do let me know how you did that. Um, and so, yeah, things things like this to, to kind of have under your belt, I think, are a really useful way of just demonstrating that you have some sort of um, prior in that world. Um, so, well, that's my hope, anyway. Um, that's why I've been sending this off to people and saying, will you please trust me? And you said that it was shown on the Channel 4 uh, Random Acts TV series. What was the response when it went out? Uh, I hope people like adjusting their set and trying to work out why it suddenly cut to black. Um, it did get through Channel 4 compliance, which I was quite pleased by. We, that was sort of a brief worry, was that they wouldn't actually be allowed to broadcast uh, the material. Um, but I don't know, yeah. I mean, that's kind of the joy of like something going out late night on Channel 4 is you don't really know who's watching it or in what manner. Um, you know, I would hope people kind of just found themselves watching it utterly confused and devoid of context, um, th which is how I experienced so many kind of like formative um, films and, and television broadcasts as a kid, especially late night on Channel 4. That feels like a very kind of formative place. Um, so I hope so, but yeah, I have no clue. Um, like there's kind of a joy in not knowing. And you said that you were m hoping to move into the kind of more of the moving image 
uh, network. Now, presumably, you were not out in the cold and the wind like Joe was when making self for spring. You were inside in the edit suite or on the phone trying to persuade people to let you have um, some some footage for this. Can you say is your is your new moving image work going to repurpose archive again, or is it going to be more live action? There'll, there'll probably be a little bit of newly shot material, but uh, yeah, primarily um, repurposing archive. Like that, that is what I've uh, done the most of. And I should say, like, I, I promise you, it is time consuming. Although <laughs> we quite like the idea that that this film looked as though we'd just taken Channel's for, Channel Four's money and literally delivered nothing. Um, it did actually take far longer than you would imagine um, for very minimal results. Um, which I think is my favorite kind of work, where uh, no one can see all of the thousands of hours of effort that have gone into it because it looks like nothing. Um, yeah, I promise, you know, we, we earned the money. And is it pretty much what you pitched to Channel 4? Did it change on the way, or, or was did the idea pretty much stay the same? No, kudos to them. Like, they, they kind of pushed for it to go more minimal and more daring. Like, I had kind of imagined um, that they would maybe be wary of the more kind of like abstract aspects of it because originally it had it had narration and so there was more sort of you were given more to hold on to and there was more kind of like i think i was so aware that that it would feel like nothing that i was kind of compensating and trying to make there be something that would a like be clearly present for a viewer but b literally just like justify the money um and yeah like fair play to them they pushed us to kind of um, take it more to its purest form, which, uh, you know, probably ultimately would have maybe not even had the titles of the bomb, except that that's a legal requirement. Um, and yeah, just kind of like get as close to the, the kind of heart of that idea as possible. So fair play. And the score, uh, to me, works so brilliantly with that. Can you talk, is that someone you worked with before? How did that come about? Yeah, that's actually one of the producers. Uh, Anthony Ng uh, also makes music under the name Home Tape. And this was, I think, the first like full film that he scored, although it's only three minutes. Um, and yeah, he did an incredible job. And, and a lot of, uh, all of that sound is also uh, sourced from film soundtracks and sort of slivers of sound that he's picked up here and there. And, and then obviously trying to, create that overarching soundscape but also have elements of the individual films kind of piercing through so that you get some sense of the divisions between the films as well as the overarching theme of like nothingness um just before we we showed it you said that you <laughs> saw it as a dance film as well can you say a bit more about i was that? slightly being facetious oh, facetious sorry um but no like i think you know i i it's hard to talk about a movie like this um, without either sounding very dismissive or very wanky. So I try to do a bit of both. Um, and like another thing that appealed to me about it is it is like a, like, like I get a certain kind of pleasure in films like this uh, that you, you see online a lot, like super cuts or whatever that just literally like compile 20 of a thing and show it to you. And I think often that can be like a really, interesting, useful, critical device to, to reveal something of, of merit or value, um, but also can just be the most banal, like, here's 20 times that Tarantino characters wore hats or whatever, and it reveals nothing. Um, so on some level, I think it's also like a satire of, of the supercut by its very nature that it, you can really compile anything and, and not necessarily reveal anything. But I hope it reveals something to you, maybe, or not. Well, let's find out. I'm going to ask, that's, that's definitely a cue to ask Jess and Morgan and Fritz and Joe to come back up. Do please love to know what you think. Have any of you made, which of you, oh, there's a question at the back already. Lady in the kind of jacket at the back. Hi, uh, yeah, my question was for Jessica and Morgan. Um, with, the, with the reversals, like how much in the edit was like the timing played with in that? Because I, I did a like a pixelation animation with random acts, and I'm quite interested in playing with like weird ways of doing live action as well, and then mixing that in with animation. So, tell me about like, did you, were you involved with the edit? I imagine you were as lead creatives. Were you involved with the edit a lot, and like the timing of that, and like how much did you mess with that a lot? Yeah, um, we did. We did the edit. Yeah, we we edited. We did the edit for the tryout ourselves um, and we play with speed a lot um, 
a lot of it was quite sped up. Um, Which we were kind of slightly regretting watching it now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, but yeah, we play with speeds, speeding it up and slowing down. We came to a little bit of problem with sort of ramping issues uh, when when they were doing the grade. But yeah, Sorry, what's um, like going from one speed to another. Like we'd have we'd have a little moment where we wanted it to look really slow as someone was a approaching a movement, and then we wanted it to really speed up, and then it can get a bit jerky in the sort of join. But um, yeah. technical. People with more of a technical background can normally like heal that problem. I think. I think we did um, in insane amounts of. Is this even working? Yes. It is. I just can't hear myself. Um, yeah, we did it especially for the tryout because it, um, it, you know, because of it having to be, I think, exactly three minutes in our case, um, and we did an insane amount of messing with speeds but also because we're kind of um really interested in creating illusions um and especially with that film not just necessarily with the reverse stuff but i think um kind of like adding to the chore the actual movement and choreography so enhancing i think there would, there would be moments like um the moment when the tambourine flies in and lands on his foot for example if you would have that reversed in real time it would just be a flash and you wouldn't see anything so we would have to kind of, for example, um, slow that down to about minus 50% in order to actually like see the frames because obviously in real time he just flicked it off and it, it's out the frame instantly. So we had to do a lot of kind of like that slowing down but then other stuff that we wanted to be more dynamic, speeding up and um, yeah, we did but it, it was slightly tricky in that instance. Any other questions from the floor? The lady over there on the back Hi, uh, yeah, thank you for the conversation. It's been really interesting and I've really loved all the films. Um, and I have a question for the dance trained filmmakers. And I was wondering, cause I'm first year Trinity Laban, so I don't have much formal training in filmmaking. So have you found whilst pursuing a career in filmmaking that there are particular things you felt you needed to research more or do more work on because of that? Hi. Do you, um, do you mean in terms of um, kind of developing ourselves as filmmakers? Um, mm. Well, I think I think that we went through a long period of really feeling inadequate and kind of questioning ourselves, saying, "Oh, we need to go to school. We need to go to film school. We're not real filmmakers." Um, and everyone kept saying, "But you're making work, so why are you um, worrying about it so much?" And I mean, I don't really know about I, I don't know all the kind of traditional ways into filmmaking but I kind of get the impression more and more that lots of people don't have that I think like a lot formal of here yeah have all come from like non-traditional filmmaking it seems like other people you know who've made films today have come from non-traditional filmmaking backgrounds so I think the most important thing is probably just to, to do it yeah. and you'll find you'll find your way yeah. that's very good advice um, more questions lady down the front Shall I just repeat the question because I didn't wait for the mic? So, um, could you have made these films without the help of Random Acts? And, and what was the most important thing that Random Acts brought to making it happen? Charlie? Um, yeah, I mean, certainly no one else was lining up to give me money to make this. Um, and I think, especially because it is in a sort of um, a sort of space between uh, art film and more traditional film uh, and the kind of essay film world that I was already in, um, it was a, a sort of difficult one to find funding for. And so really it was just an idea that I had kind of shelved along with a load of other ideas that I couldn't think how I would get to make. Um, and obviously it wasn't massively expensive, but it was still sort of more than I could uh, put together myself. Um, so yeah, like I, I, for me, it was just an amazing opportunity to make something that could be like a bridge into doing a new kind of work, which I think is probably the hardest thing to find funding for because it's the thing you don't have any track record in. Um, even if you've made previous stuff, like I guess everyone here had, that was perhaps in a slightly different space. Um, so yeah, that was the, the biggest benefit for me. And what about 
Um, Fritzi and Joe. Um, I actually don't think we could have made it without um, random acts and uh, particularly because of the budget uh, flying out to Iceland um, getting the crew and the kit involved like 90% of the budget on flying everyone out to Iceland yeah just a, it's really the accommodation and the flights um, that was uh, the most important part of the budget but also I mean you and Oscar you put more money into it um, and uh, yeah we, I don't th if maybe if, if it would have been um, a script that would have been filmed here in London, you can probably make it without, uh, because you have your 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 resources here and you know everyone. But if you plan to go abroad, I think um, we couldn't have made that without. Yeah. yeah. So it was really important to answer your question to have um, random acts in Channel Four uh, involved. Yeah. And Jess Morgan. Um. Yeah, you know, we used. I mean, we used all the the budget, and I don't think we could have. No, no, couldn't have made it without. But also, you said earlier on that actually this idea came because of that scheme, and that of course you wanted it to, to make work. But actually, you had you the the confines of the scheme provoked you to come up with that idea. Yeah, uh, it it sort of. Um, it inspired the concept for the film and also we wouldn't have worked with Adriano who is the composer for it. Um, I think we also wouldn't have expanded and worked with such a with a bigger crew as well. So it wouldn't have given us that push. Okay, uh, there's a lady at the back. I'm going to try and wait in the white t-shirt there with the short hair and the glasses. There's a mic just coming to you. Uh, I just wanted to ask Fritzi uh, how you go about producing films. So... If do people send in pit, sort of pictures to you, and you'd, or do you work with people that you already know? Um, probably two two um, things. So I um, I run a production company, and um, we represent directors. Who, um, so usually we get commissioned or we do commercials. So people come to us with um, with a script or an idea for an ad, and then we um, we execute it. We uh, bring it to life, or um, in the case. Of Oscar and Joe, they um, they called me up. They sent me the script. Um, I loved it, and we made it happen. So it's it's a bit of both, really. And um, once you know, it's kind of you, you you when you when you like the idea, you just do everything possible to make it happen. It's um, depending, you know, not not depending on the budget. Um, you just you just do it. The gentleman with the cap. Uh, yeah, this is for Charlie. Um, you mentioned working with Eric Wareheim earlier. Uh, I was just wondering if we could hear a little more about that and how the two of you came into contact. Oh yeah, sorry if I implied that I worked with Eric Wareheim. I didn't work with Eric Wareheim. He, he hosted the series of random acts that this was broadcast on. Uh, so I met Eric Wareheim, which was like a, a life high point. Um, but no, we, we have yet to collaborate. Um, Ball's very much in his court on that one. <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, no, it was it was. I, I I got to like go in and be interviewed by him because they did one interview on each episode of the show. So that that was as close as I've come to uh, developing a strong bond with Eric Wareheim. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, it was enough for me. And there's the gentleman down the front. Uh, yeah, I'll just try to um, There's a mic coming anyway. Oh great. Uh, yeah, I guess my question is just. Uh, for Joe, because I think that I kind of got an idea from uh, the others to what extent this was similar to how you'd created work before. Because you talked about working with a smaller crew. Mm -hmm. So do, do, do you feel that um, this film was a radical departure in terms of how you've made your work before? Was it with similar people? You said you worked with a cinematographer. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or was this a big step up or a big step in a different direction? Um, it was kind of... Yeah, it was similar and different. Um, me and Oscar have usually just made films, just the two of us, with no budget whatsoever. So this is the first time we had any money to play with. And of course, we blew it on flying everyone out to Iceland <laughs> and not paying anyone. And everyone was working for free, which is absolutely amazing. But um, just having all of these people um, giving us the benefit of their experience was something that we'd never really had before. So that was a huge step up and really beneficial. Okay, and oh, still down the front, um, the lady here with the long hair. Hi, 
Um, thanks to everyone speaking about their films today. I had another question for Charlie, and I wanted to ask what your thinking was behind using a sort of overarching score for your film piece, which I suppose is a bit playing devil's advocate because I think it worked well, but rather than using the audio from the original film clips. Yeah, I, I did a debate back and forth. Um, I, I made a version that was just like the completely raw audio from each film, and um, the effect was so jarring to be constantly jolted between a new kind of sonic landscape every four or five seconds that in my like experience watching it it focused all of your attention on the sound and so it became a movie essentially about like sound design in films and and very specifically like the contrasts between different sound designs um which was kind of interesting in its own way but i was so trying to focus people's attention in at the the nothingness and, and what they could kind of perceive through the darkness that I felt like you needed a, to be lulled a bit more and, and less kind of jolted every five seconds. Um, so I tried to kind of strike some sort of compromise there where, where it would have a score that would kind of be this overarching thing to kind of envelop you to some extent, but also elements of the original soundtracks in a kind of slightly different um, our role feel for each one so that you would still get a sense of moving between them. Um, but yeah, I, I think in an ideal world it, it, it might have been as you describe if, if that hadn't felt quite so. Uh, the main problem was like music, was when certain scenes had big brassy scores on them or whatever, it was just too throwing. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? Now's your time. Um, thanks for the thanks for the panel. Um, I suppose this one's for each of you, really. Um, what's next? What projects do you have in the pipeline? What's the next thing you're working on? Uh, so I, I'm making another short at the moment that's actually nothing like this. Um, it's a, a kind of uh, more straightforward documentary about conspiracy theories, and then uh, after that, hopefully making. Uh, another essay feature um, that would be more, uh, not as avant-garde as this, but like more in that kind of artist moving image world, if anyone will ever give me money for that. So we'll see. It might be a while. Um, the next film that, uh, well, me, me and Jess, because obviously we're doing our own Jess's Dancing and I'm choreographing other projects, but we're, we're hoping to uh, make a film about um, Taglioni, a kind of his <laughs> historical, mythical dance film. Um, Taglioni uh, was the first dancer to ever go on point. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, we're kind of in the process of trying to uh, raise funds for that and platforms, etc., etc. Yeah. Um, so when we originally pitched the Sulphur Spring film, we were going to work with... Um, a uh, dance artist called Wendy Houston, and unfortunately she had to like pull out um, fairly early on. So we'd still we're trying to work out how to make a film with her still because we really really want to. Um, so we're just trying to figure that out ways to make that happen at the moment. Um, I'm I'm working on quite a few things at the moment. Um, I'm I'm actually f we're working on a commercial at the moment. So I'm flying out to Spain tomorrow for a casting session and shooting um, in a couple of um, weeks. Um, I'm also working on two documentaries at the moment. Um, we've uh, we've shot uh, music videos um, recently in um, Ghana and in India. And um, on the back of that, we're making two documentaries about uh, both of the subject mat matters. Um, and uh, yeah, loads basically. <laughs> Great. Any more questions from the floor? Well, I, I'm going to say thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. If you're interested in applying for Random Acts Big Dance, there is a call out now for Random Acts Big Dance India, so films that have an element, obviously, of film and dance and something to do with the UK and India, and you can find details on the Big Dance site or on the British Council site, um, if you just put in UK India 2017, because as you may or may not know, this is a big year of collaborations between the UK and India. Please put an application in. You've got till the 3rd of May to do it. 
Um, I hope today's given you some uh, food for thought. And um, thanks very much to the panel for sharing all their thoughts. And thanks to you for coming. <laughs>